Welcome to Hey, Great Shot. This is the Great Shot Podcast, a Crack Rackets and Tennis Channel Podcast Network production. My name is Alex Gruskin. On today's show, we've got another edition of The Deciding Point, our weekly breakdown of everything happening in the Division I college tennis world. Of course, here on Tuesday nights, we break down the Division I women's action. And before we get to talking about anything that unfolded during a busy week 11 of this 2024 season, first, let me just say it is so great to be back doing these shows live on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. For some of you, it'll be a debut look at our recently renovated Crack Rackets studio. Certainly happy to show that off and a shout out as always to our super producer Daniel Westoff who as you can imagine did all of the fantastic decorating you did behind me we've got the hats of the reigning NCAA champions UNC Virginia sitting behind me we will switch out those hats when we have new NCAA champions that'll be the theme in the studio we're going to rep the champs always here thankfully the hat collection should allow me to show off everyone over the years moving forward but just a little explanation for why they get the crown spot here in the studio. I should also say it's really great to be joined once again here live on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel to help break down week 11 of this Division I women's college tennis season by a man who, of course, you all know as the returning champion of returning champions here on our Crack Rackets podcast. He, of course, now founded his own blog and podcast. No ad, no problem. Of course, all of you also know him as a co-host of our Deciding Point episodes, our on-the-ground correspondent throughout the course of this 2024 season. And most importantly, that smiling face you see belongs to my dear friend, John J. Parsons, who joins us once again. Jay, hey, great shot. Welcome back to the show. We are live on YouTube. That's another element of excitement, does it not, my friend? How are you doing tonight? Well, you certainly have to dot your I's and cross your T's when you're live on YouTube. Uh, so it's good to be back. It's been a while. It's nice to have some of these distractions with the studio behind you. I get to have some, uh, you know, it's a sight for sore eyes in a lot of ways, but very excited to be back on YouTube. It feels professional. Thank you to Westoff. It's always a good time. Yeah, I feel like it accentuates my points to have the flashing lights behind me. It's my own version of going beep. But in a visual format, and for listeners who are hearing this podcast who may not have been aware, we've made the switch back to YouTube. Now you have a reason to come watch us next week. Thankfully, I should be in Indianapolis until the NCAA tournament. Thus, we should be able to do these shows now every week moving forward. Again, we'll be breaking down the Division One women's action Tuesday night starting 9 p.m. Eastern time here on our YouTube channel. We will be back tomorrow and every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time moving forward throughout the course of this season to break down the Division One men's action with Chris Halioris as well. But Jay, as we have now introduced ourselves back here on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel, we can start getting into what was a fascinating week 11 of the 2024 season. It really is starting to look like we will have an undefeated number one team in the country heading into the NCAA tournament. Now to make matters that much more intriguing, that number one team will get to play the entirety of the NCAA tournament at home as Oklahoma State. They continue to cement their place at the top of the women's game. Another undefeated weekend, this time wins over Texas. Oklahoma will break both of those down on today's show. We got to talk about a chaotic, chaotic weekend of ACC play as well. Not just Wolfpack versus UNC, but of course Duke knocking off NC State in Raleigh on Sunday. You had a four-hour, 25-minute thriller I was on the call of between Georgia Tech and Miami, so you know I've got a few thoughts on that as well. Just a lot of chaos there. Obviously, you've got some teams, Virginia, Pepperdine staying hot, some sneaky good weekends I want to get to as well, and then we can start talking rankings coming out of week 11. We can look towards week 12, and then in honor of our debut back on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel, we've got a really fun segment to end today's show. It's uh, dare I say, in my quest to fulfill Jay qu- Jay's quest to bring back 2018 Gruskin, I like to think it's a segment right up 2018 Gruskin's alley as we're going to talk hypothetical trades we'd like to see between rosters that, dare I say, I think might make this season that much more spicy. So that's our agenda for today's show. Again, 
I'm really happy to be back on YouTube. I'm going to the gym every day moving forward, Jake, because I know i got to go look good for the listeners and viewers now each and every week. Uh, but again, more than anything, we know it's our job to talk college tennis, and obviously we appreciate those of you in the college tennis community joining us here live. We appreciate all of you, of course, who listen to the podcast as well. And again, we encourage you. Come listen to us live or come watch us live. You can send us questions during the show if you have any. We'd be happy to answer them. All of that said, Jay, let's get into what was a really fun week 11 of this 2024 college tennis season. And I do think the place we have to start is with a team that, yeah, we've spent a lot of time discussing this year. How could we not? They're the number one team in the country. It's March 26th. We are a full three months into this season. Not only are they now the national indoor champions, they're undefeated through three months of play. And as we said at the end of the national indoors, they've played a schedule to the point where they are, they could lose the rest of the way. They're still going to be a top eight seed. Of course, we are referring to Oklahoma State, who, Jay, another successful weekend, another fantastic weekend uh, for the Cowgirls who go on the road, knock off Texas 4-3. They also get a 4-1 win over a rising and getting healthier, I would hope, by the day Oklahoma squad 4-1. There are a lot of different places we can take this. Obviously, Komar clinching in the fashion she did. Some of you might have seen the match point. It was on an overrule. That's always an extra degree of spice. Obviously, for these two teams, they've now played two 4-3 matches with immense amounts of drama. You can go back to Shavat Panapa set in 4-love in the National Indoor Quarterfinals. Sophia Carrington working her way all the way back to a three-set victory. Oklahoma State for three winners. That's propelled them to the run we've seen throughout the course of this 2024 season. Again, it's just another notch, though, in the belt for this Cowgirl squad, Jay. They are the unequivocal number one team in the country. What impressed you most about their weekend? Well, I think what continues to impress me about Oklahoma State is they find ways to win regardless. And a lot of these matches, they're not steamrolling through some of these opponents. I think the Oklahoma match in particular is a great example. There was a 10-minute stretch there once uh, Julia Garcia Ruiz won at number one against Komar that you thought it was very possible Oklahoma was going to pull the upset because you had Donna Guzman who had a match point in her match at five and six, they were starting to pull away early in those third sets was Oklahoma, but Oklahoma state, if you play that match out, they probably win it six one. And so it's been every single person on that team who has contributed, of course, doubles as well. And it hasn't been always smooth sailing. They've had a lot of three set battles that they've had to come through and win. They've really been battle tested so many times. So you're starting to develop a lot of confidence in this team that even when things are really dicey, they'll find a way to pull it out. And for me, that's been most impressive. Yeah. The thing is they haven't been steamrolling opponents in conference play. Now they find wins and it matches are never really in doubt. I think it's important to mention that key piece of context, but it's not like Komar is just steamrolling everyone at the top spot. Obi's certainly having another really good year at number two, but again, it's not like she's undefeated and o and owing people at that position. Heck, her match in the Oklahoma match, she goes unfinished there. Now, she does get a 2-4 and four win over Malika Rapalu against Texas, and that was a massive win in straight sets for the Cowgirls, particularly considering they dropped the doubles point in that Texas match. I mean, again, for Oklahoma State to go on the road, down a doubles point, and find three straight set singles victories, Jay, they get it from OB at two, and then once again, it's the fifth year's Novak Carrington at four and six. Whenever Oklahoma State has needed those two to pull through in singles, they always have. And again, those are two players who play number one singles in their lineup prior to the start of this year, Carrington at LSU, Novak here at Oklahoma State. They should be successful if asked to go through to four through the sixth spot. But, you know, everything looks good on paper. You got to see it play out. And so far this year, those two have been, dare I say, you know, they were national indoor all tournament team, I believe selections are certainly in that conversation. I know there was some lineup chicanery, so it didn't always work out great. But like, what has separated Oklahoma State from the rest of the pack? It's their depth. It's Carrington. It's Komar. It's obviously Miyamoto's been really good at that five spot, but she loses on this day to Vivian Uvarutsky. Like, Komar comes through when they, again, I mentioned, just to, to put the full circle here on this rant, and I know that's very Texas-centric, but, like, it hasn't always been Komar, and yet, on this day, when they needed her, 
she pulled through. You know, they didn't need her in the Oklahoma match where they're able to take doubles. They're able to take three, four, and five and, you know, again, get the win in that fashion. This team just has options, Jay. I guess that's the theme is the best teams can find four points in any fashion. This team has some locks as well. Obviously, Novak at six, Carrington the way she's been playing at four, and then you feel like they're always going to get one of Komar and Obi at one and two. If the bet for them in finding a fourth point is they just need to win one of doubles and one of th- or one of three and five, like you take that bet. They just have pathways to four. This team is number one good, Jay, and given all the chaos in the ACC we're going to talk about, like I just think three months into the season, this is the first time I can say confidently, no, 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 no. Oklahoma State is the, I mean, no disrespect to them, and maybe some will take that as disrespect that I'm now saying this is the first time you can say it confidently. But they've proved it for three months. They went to Austin and got this win. By the way, second straight year they've done that. That's really impressive, Jay. This group, like, they've earned it. They have earned that benefit of the doubt now. They are number one. They absolutely are. I do think if you're going to play devil's advocate a tad here, this was the weekend you circled for Oklahoma State because you did want to see them get tested. You also wanted to see them get tested outdoors. And both of these matches, I think, have asterisks next to them. One for Texas, they did not have their number one player, Sabina Zainalova. That's a huge asterisk in this match. Number two for Oklahoma, this match was indoors. They don't want to play that match indoors. They want to play that match outdoors. Same thing for Oklahoma State. They need to get these reps outdoors. So this was the weekend you circled on the calendar for Oklahoma State to get over the hump. These are their toughest competitors in conference play. They get through. But if you really want to put some asterisks on it, I think you can. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, again, the pushback would be everyone got to win this weekend. Every point. Doubles, 3, 4, and 5 against Oklahoma. 1, 2, 4, and 6 against Texas. Like, that's a really good weekend for the Cowgirls. But you're right. You would have liked to see that match outdoors. It wasn't a full-strength Texas team, although credit to Oklahoma State. In that instance, they should go out then and find four singles victories, and they do. On the other side of the equation, looking at the Texas part of things, I mean, again, to be down Zainalova and you know the fact that it comes down to the number one spot, 6-4 in the third, Komar beat Sassanaskaya, like to find, that might be Sassanaskaya's best result of the dual match season. Like I know she's on the wrong end of it, Jay, but she's been needing to get things going. On the Oklahoma side of things, I know I saw the tweet from you, Julia Garcia Ruiz, sometimes you saw more slumps, sometimes you saw more surge. She is clearly the latter playing outstanding tennis and You know, again, in that Oklahoma State match, I I believe she got the 4-4 and win over Anastasia Komar. Where are you with Texas and Oklahoma coming out of this weekend? So for Texas, at some point you need to start winning these 4-3 matches. And you can only feel good about teams for losing close matches to tough teams for so long. At some point, they need to come out on the other end, and they really have one more shot to do it, and that's the Big 12 tournament. I think they will certainly be looking for a rematch against Oklahoma State in doing that. feels like we just haven't seen a full comprehensive performance from this Texas team, and we didn't get that this past weekend with the absence of Zayna Lova. So to me, stock is dipping a little bit for Texas. On the flip side for Oklahoma, massive weekend for them to get uh, Florencia Arusha back in the lineup. This is her first singles match since she was uh, out at the indoor kickoff weekend. So huge for them now to have a continually getting healthy lineup, both Shershabina and Arusha back in the lineup. You feel like they will be much better in three weeks time. So Oklahoma State, they're going to ride through the regular season undefeated. And then they will see if they get upset at home in either the Big 12 tournament or NCAAs. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah, Oklahoma's top 16 frisky. They can play anyone tight. They've done that all season long. It's funny you mentioned Texas will have one more shot to get a big W. Oklahoma, it feels like they're on the wrong end of 4-3 against just about everyone but San Diego this year as well. And yet it does continue to be 4-3 matches and Feels like we've had them had a, uh, ha- see them have a fully healthy squad maybe once this year, and you can't say that about their team against Oklahoma State. I know they had Arushia back, but she's still playing her way back into form. Big Twelve has been really good over these last four years. Obviously, the 2022 final featuring Texas Oklahoma, 
it hasn't been the most traditional pathway, but they still have three top 16 programs. They still have three teams that expect to see themselves in the final site. And, you know, certainly that is something uh, for us to take note of as we hit the home stretch of conference play in the Big 12 and hit that final month of conference play in April. I mean, Oklahoma is going to be right on the top 16 bubble. Like they might have to beat Texas in the Big 12 conference semifinal to get a top 16 berth. And just a little storyline to plant in all of your heads to monitor moving forward coming out of that conference. Oklahoma State undefeated, unanimous number one coaches, uh, excuse me, in our Cracked Rackets poll, in the ITA computer polls. Not the worst gift, John Parsons, for Chris Young on his birthday today. Happy birthday to the Oklahoma State women's tennis coach. Obviously, we're all looking forward to going down to Stillwater for NCAA's Oklahoma State. If the women's team is there, it's very likely at this point they will be undefeated entering that final side. And boy, wouldn't that be a fun storyline for us to monitor, Jay, down the 2024 season's home stretch. That said, it's not only the Big 12 providing fun results right now in the college tennis world, Jay. I happen to be treated to, I think, the most exciting weekend f- produced by any conference in week number 11. That, of course, was the ACC. And, I mean, the place we have to start is in Raleigh. The two four three results we saw Let's go glass half full first because we had a 2023 NCAA final rematch. NC State taking on North Carolina. It was the Wolfpack on the right end of that one. A match played indoors due to rain. They drop the doubles point, Jay. Uh, but ultimately, you know, again, they were able to find four singles victories. They take the corners one in six. They also get a three set win, what, on courts, I believe. Two uh, on courts three and four. Three as zero well. Nova yes. over and so, and Dittman over to Again, Hillary. UNC doesn't have Brant Meyer. They've taken the Maserati out of the garage. We're starting to see more Elizabeth Scotty. She plays two matches this weekend and goes 2 0 in both of them. You do feel like maybe there's a world where she sneaks her way up to number one in that singles lineup, just again, given how well she's playing. Well, she already has. Did she play one against Wake Forest? Oh, no, she played one a couple no. weeks ago. You're right. A couple yeah, weeks ago. Shout yeah. out to you on that note. Anyways, we'll get to that thought in a moment. But NC State drops the doubles point in this match. And, you know, Riley Tran takes a first set on court number three. Scotty takes a really quick straight set match at two over Red and Shelley. You had Tan Gillig fighting her way back on four. Yarlagata really good from the start on five. But these NC State Wolfpack, Jay, I mean, again, they are not afraid of North Carolina. It's probably the team they look forward to playing most. How could they not after what they've done over these last two years, but last three years, really, between these two schools? I was there for that 2022 uh, National Indoor Semifinal in Madison. That was a really fun match for those of us that remember. The point is, there's obviously something special between these two, and whenever they share this court, you see that manifested. UNC goes out, I believe, into a 3-1 lead, I want to say overall. No. 2-1? 2-1? Was it 3-1? Anyway, Scotty wins quickly, so it's 2-love overall. Uh, yeah, excuse me. It was 2-love overall, then it was 2-all, as Riley Tran up a set, 5-4, unable to close things out. Anya Zironova works her way back. Now, Tran had to take an injury timeout at the end of doubles. She had to, obviously was dealing with some leg issues throughout the course of that third set as well, but... Zeranova again finds magic against the Tar Heels. She won the clinch against them at the National Indoor. She flips that match in three. Now it's two all overall after Rejecki got another straight set win over Crawley at one. And that was really good tennis. But again, Rejecki just has the weapons. That is, it's a matchup issue for UNC. Crawley versus Rejecki at one. It's two all overall. And again, really good matches coming down to the finish line. A shout out uh, at number four, Gina Dittman, able to come through three sets over Carson Tangilla. Gets up an early break in the third and never let it go. You know, it's three, two overall. But of course, there are only four indoor courts at NC State. So we were going to get to sit there for a while for those final two matches. Yarla got a blitz through hers. She was really good at five. She was playing like someone who got clinched on the last time the, uh, these two teams played. And, you know, again, that was a definitive straight set victory for her over a Sophie Abrams, who has certainly struggled over the last six weeks. And then it came down to a battle at six, Jay. And I apologize because that monologue was probably a little longer than it should have been. But that's how much I enjoyed the four and a half hours of this match because I got to call it all. And again, we got to watch the entirety of two of your top freshmen in the country, Maddie Zimpardo taking on Tatum Evans at that sixth spot, match on the line. You know, again, indoors advantage Zimpardo, whose weapons were just 
dictating everything that was happening throughout the course of the play. Evans could not find a cross-court forehand to save her life. And honestly, I thought that match was going to be over in an hour 15. Sam Pardo was up a break in 4-2. Evans was finding no form. It just felt like it was over. NC State had it. They were going to pull off the upset again. Then all of a sudden, things for Zampardo go haywire. The forehand starts spraying. She missed some volleys that were just like, they're going to show her on film and be like, Maddie, I know you won the match, but come on. We're not doing this ever again. Evans forces a third set. I was having a lot of success pulling the backhand uh, cross and just getting Zampardo stretched. And all of a sudden, we're in the third. All of a sudden, things get a little spicy. In the end, Zampardo able to close things out in that third set. NC State able to earn a second victory over UNC on the year 4-3. Let's just start there, Jay, because obviously, again, there's a part two to this act, but NC State does it. Like, after losing to Syracuse the weekend prior, not often in tennis do you have a look-ahead loss like that, but that's starting to feel like what it was. As they came back, they beat the Tar Heels. What was your reaction? Uh, I mean, they just have the North Carolina cheat code at this point. I mean, last season when they beat North Carolina in the ACC finals, the first time they had beaten North Carolina since 1998. At this point in the season, they've beaten them twice. I do think there are some matchups there that heavily favor NC State. But I, and we'll get to the act two of this, but I was like, this just feels so NC State. We (laughs) talked about this like week in, week out, just the volatility that we've seen to lose to a Syracuse team that has since gone on to lose to most everybody else, and then to beat North Carolina after dropping the dubs point, it's NC State in in a nutshell. Um, I don't really know what else to say other than they have North Carolina's number at this point. I mean, Rejecki and Zimpardo go 2-0 and over UNC on the day. And again, their weapons indoors are just amplified that much more. And you do want to see this matchup outside because things do start to look a little bit different. I mean, again, the moment Riley Tran lost that second set, all I could think in the broadcast booth was, all right, this match is going, uh, you know, I, NC State's taking this match. Like with how strong Zimpardo has started with the, you know, Tran running on fumes down the home stretch of that one. And again, she almost, she was up 4-2 in the third. Like she had her chances to win that match still. But a credit to Zeranova, who was just able to extend things, find ways to get out of the deuce points and there were a lot of them throughout the course of that third set it was a clutch moment for NC State at home and a win again they desperately needed after losing to Syracuse after losing road matches to Oklahoma and Michigan after the national indoors as well it felt like balance had restored to the force and then you get to Sunday and NC State again they take the doubles point one love lead. They take the corners. Zimpardo and Rejecki, who have a, the artist formerly known as Amelia Rejecki, excuse me, who had fantastic weekends. And like their weapons are just real. And again, the size, the aggression they play with, it's perfect for the style of play Coach Earnshaw wants to develop with his NC State players. That first strike, first aggression, play on your terms sort of tennis. They are both able to do that really successfully. You know, again, it was three love NC State for a hot second. But then, Jay, they lose straight set matches. They don't just lose. They lose straight set matches at two, three, four, and five to a Duke team that got swept by Florida State and Miami, to a Duke team that lost a match at home to the Georgia Tech women. This Duke team then comes on the road. And again, this weekend they dropped doubles points in both matches. They did get a 4-1 win over Wake, but they drop a bad doubles point there. Again, they drop a doubles point where they were down everywhere against NC State. They find four straight set matches in singles. Again, wins from Kim He at two uh, over Renchelli, a win at three. Bryce Golova was first one off in her matchup against Zeranova. You do wonder how much did Zeranova have left in the tank. It was a really physical Friday match, but still, again, that's a blowout for Bryce Golova, who has had some ups and downs certainly this year. Katie Codd's been really good at for Duke, and we'll get back to that Dittman match in a moment because that was really, really fun, but... Again, at five, like another tough loss for Sophie Abrams, who had break leads in that second set, but ultimately falls in straights as well at five to 
Uh, who did she lose to? She lost to not Barankova. She lost to Brianna Schwetz, who has had a good year for Duke. It's really been Schwetz, Cod, find our way to two more. But straight sets everywhere, Jay, two through five. Like, what a follow-up for a Duke team that, like, talk about it. Like, let's do glass half full here for a half second. Oh, my God, did Duke need this victory, Jay. But it was a surprising one to see, nevertheless, especially after the Wolfpack took Friday's match. What, over at UNC, what was your reaction to Sunday? Classic NC State. <laughs> like, I mean, I was I was shocked. There's not enough NIL money in the world to buy <laughs> wins for Rinchelli and Abrams right now. It is, like, really tough. And Rietzky, Zampardo have been good at the corners, but that middle of the lineup is been really challenging Dittman has been better since she was early in the season uh indoors I was surprised that she beat Tan Gillig in that UNC match but yeah you're just putting yourself in a big hole when you're not getting wins from two of your seniors yeah and no I, it's just you're right like I, Abrams in particular is the shocking thing because she was so good in the fall Jay so good and it's just like, it again, we had the weekend where I think it was three weeks ago she was up for sets in both of her matches and lost them both in three. Has a good weekend against Syracuse. Like, she was able to get a win there, but has been moved down to the number five spot. And, again, for her to lose in straight sets against Yarlagata, that one's a little bit more forgivable. But to lose in straight sets in the fashion she did against Schwetz, to have that second set lead, to see it slip away, particularly when, again, they were up 3-2. It was down to her. Dittman, and Dittman was up a break early in her third, uh, second set three love. Schwetz was up 4-2 and 5-4, or excuse me, Schwetz. Uh, Abrams was up 4-2 and I think even 5-3 and had these opportunities and, you know, neither of them able to close out that second set. Look, again, glass half full. Rejecki and Zimpardo should put two points on the board every time at one and six. And, like, you're going to bet on NC State to win doubles, right? So that's three. You still, this team still has too much talent, two through five, to be written off, Jay, is what I'm trying to say. And that they've beaten UNC twice is just proof. On the right day, this team can beat anyone. But there's certainly some, a, a delta between ceiling and floor. Yeah, or it's an indictment on the level of North Carolina. Oh. And we just haven't seen them tested against the other top teams in the ACC to really pressure test that theory, right? They haven't yet played Duke. They haven't yet played Virginia. So we'll have to calibrate over these next few weeks. So that's where we have to go next as we look at this, is the UNC side of things. And they do bounce back. They get a 4-0 win over Wake Forest. They take the doubles point pretty comfortably. Yara Legata into the doubles lineup. I think she's playing with Scotty at two, and then they're going Evans and someone at that number Forbes. three. Forbes at the number three spot. Thank you, Crawley, Tan Gillig, the reigning NCAA champs, back up to one. What is this? Like, where do we hold this UNC team now? What's the standard they play to the rest of the season? Because, look, again, you throw out the Virginia Sunday match. This team has still only lost two matches, both to, to NC State. But I was going through the resume as I was trying to come up with my rankings. And, look, they beat Georgia early in the season. That win will certainly help them as we move forward. But that team had Reese Brantmeyer, completely different team. Like, you can't count that victory as you try to quantify where this UNC team now currently sits, you know, again, Tran clearly dealing with some injuries. How healthy will she be down the season's home stretch? Tan Gillig just hasn't been playing her best tennis here in 2024 and certainly will need to right the ship. Probably has a Rejecki problem, but otherwise I actually think has been just fine. Like, Well, she was having a Casey Wooten problem as well. That's true, but, you know, again— <sighs> The match didn't play out. You're right, like, again, is it untouchable at that number one spot? Right. The Maserati is hot right now. Like, oh, very. The engine is running well for Elizabeth Scotty. And so, again, yeah. that switch to one feels inevitable. Here's the thing. They still have eight solid options for six spots or seven solid options, right? Like Crawley, uh, Scotty, Yarlagata, Tangillig, uh, Tran, Forbes, Evans, Rabman. And Rabman. Yeah, Rabman. That is still a very competitive team. Like, that is still a very. team that should be in the mix moving forward. That said, look, they've got the Duke match on Saturday. That's a huge data point for this group in particular. Virginia still on the horizon as well. Obviously, that's almost a must-win match for UNC. But more than anything, I want to see what the lineup looks like and how this team fares at the ACC tournament. 
because why this group maybe had the benefit of the doubt more than anyone else is we had just seen them win three matches in a row in three days or four matches in a row on four days at the National Indoors more than any other group in the country, just period. And this group, this iteration, hasn't done that. And so, yeah, of course, these regular season matchups are pivotal, but I want to see how this team does in tournament play with, you know, uh, uh, sudden death elimination matches back to back to back consecutively and what the lineup looks like when they get there. Like, again, Evans Zampardo, I think, looks really different outdoors than it does indoors. I do think, like, we know, again, Rabin and Evans are now going to get a ton of run this next month of the year. They need all the experience they can get heading into May. No one's writing UNC off, but in the inner circle, they are not the first team in the circle. They're not winning the Duck Duck Goose right now, Jay. Like, they got some work to do to re-solidify their spot. Yeah, and I honestly don't think we know how far in that Duck Duck Goose game they are right now. Because on paper, if you were to read me that lineup, I would say that team can still win this NCAA sure. team title without Reese. Like that's very much in the cards, but we're seeing that team without Reese right now. And that team doesn't live up to the expectations on paper. So there is a lot of deltas happening in terms of expectations and reality. And we just need to see this team get more reps. What do you make of Duke? What do we do with them? After this victory over NC State, are they back in the top 16 hunt for you? Do you, Obviously, you have to put more faith in them now. Look, in theory, Bryce Golova, Schvetz, 3-5 respectively. That's a lot of experience there. Jackson's a junior now as well. They win this match without Ellie Coleman, who yeah. hasn't been healthy either. Like This team still has, obviously not the talent you imagined, in a Freeman chloe Beck world back in June of last year. But this team... Now that they get a win like this, you can talk yourself into the talent. Katie Codd really does seem to be finding her footing here after you know coming in as a really highly touted prospect, but not really contributing last year. She is certainly playing a significant role here in 2024. You know, again, I think we'll learn a lot about them in this UNC match on Saturday, Jay, but are they back to being top 16 frisky for you? Well, technically, absolutely, right? Because they have the points that they can go and secure either in beating North Carolina this weekend or making a run in the ACC tournament. So it's very much on the table for Duke. We need to see more reps from it if I were to put them there, but um, it's very much on the table. Yeah, it's again what they I, I, they started off the ACC in the worst possible fashion, right? Losses to Florida State and Miami, and now – they're, they're chasing the rest of the way, and this is a win they had to chase. To get. By the way, the Wake Forest win was pretty good as well for them. Four, one, four straight set victories, and they were up everywhere when that match finished. So chaotic weekend in the ACC, and again, we'll do this match quickly before we move on to other things. But, oh my God, Jay, was Miami-Georgia Tech just mwah, just mwah. Oh, one of the better regular season matches you will ever see. And I know that sounds hyperbolic, but... Like, again, doubles point was pretty lopsided the way of the Yellow Jackets. Everything else wasn't. And to see in particular, first of all, Carol Lee versus Alexa Noel was the exact sort of three-set battle, grind, contrast of styles you hoped it would be. Five of the six matches went three sets, and the only one that didn't was a six-and-five finish at number five that went the way of Georgia Tech. Like, you know, the match between Fenning and Bilchev, I think went nine hours. In fact, they still might be grinding because they were like, let's just make it three out of five. And everything went three sets. And by the way, Georgia Tech, I think, won five first sets at the two through six spots. But Miami continued to claw their way back. And really good win for sophomore Shin Yi Nong over Shara Burra, who's been a rock for Georgia Tech at six. And yet, again, Georgia Tech might be my sneaky favorite. They're my new Wisconsin or my new Auburn from years past where it's like, do I think they're winning a national championship? No. Am I going to turn them on every time they're playing because something funky just seems to happen? Absolutely. was a massive win for Georgia Tech. Tough loss for a Miami team that, again, has still played like four matches total on the year and kind of needs every win they can get. But it was really good college tennis, Jay. Any thoughts on that before we move uh, beyond this uh, move on? Well, I'm looking at the results of this match, and it's just striking that Alexa Noel is down to 19 in the individual rankings. Yeah. Carol Lee at 45. That's crazy. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah, they're they're going to be on their way up. Again, that was 
a really fun match, and that's a really good win for a Georgia Tech team that isn't going to be top 16 because they started the season so freaking slowly, but uh, the level, they're just, again, I don't want them in my region if I'm any top 16 seed in the country come the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament because on the right day, with yeah, we're doing a segment later on trades. Let's just say I tried to find a national championship contending home for Carol Lee and Kate Charbora as a combo. They're also a doubles team, I think like 11 in the country right now. I spent north of an hour trying to find them the right home. <laughs> I just want to be honest with all of you because I, I do think they are that. Like, There's just some pieces there that are interesting. And again, if you could pay that off and give them some pieces moving forward, maybe they'd be interesting. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's stick in the ACC. We'll do this one a little bit more quickly, Jay. But the best team we don't talk about enough is the University of Virginia, who just continues to beat teams who are worse than them in the convincing fashion that a top eight inner circle team should. And this past weekend, 6-1 win over Boston College, 5-2 over a Syracuse team that did beat NC State last weekend, but lost both their matches to Virginia, Virginia Tech this weekend. So read into that whatever you will. Still, you know, again, they almost dropped the doubles point against Boston College. They ultimately didn't, but then singles started, and they raced out to five of six first sets and got three straight set singles victories, you know, same thing, again, competitive doubles point against Syracuse, but once we hit the singles portion, things really weren't. The Heba Shake jump this season continues to seem real. It feels like Annabelle Shue gets more and more comfortable in those top two spots. Chervinsky getting healthier by the day. She's turning into a real option with real weapons at four. Ziodato playing really good ball. They're just good. They are good everywhere, and... You have to win doubles against them because they can find three singles victories against anyone. They have that sort of depth. In a conference filled with uncertainty, Jay, are they the sure thing? Like, they still haven't faced the big tests. NC State, uh, UNC, Duke. But other than that, like, this Virginia team, like, like, again, they've only lost to Michigan, Jay. They have to be the favorites now, right? They're the one sure thing. Well, I think you're following falling into a scheduling trap here. Okay. We talked about like this, this post indoors because they But the Pepperdine kind of, win ages well every day. Right. A Pepperdine win that they get indoors, yeah. right? But we knew coming into this season that they were going to have their indoors matches and then basically the lower rung of the ACC until all of a sudden last few weekends it is NC State, UNC, Duke, Miami, Georgia Tech, Florida State. They have all of those teams coming up. And so, yes, they right now control their own destiny because they're the only team undefeated here in the ACC. But we don't have nearly enough data on this Virginia team outdoors to really judge them on if they are in that inner circle. It's very possible that they are. They're certainly putting down the numbers, like you mentioned, against these other teams to suggest that they are at that elite level. But had a lot of day, of tennis to play for this Virginia team. Let me team. just run the numbers quickly. Travinsky and Collard are seven and five at the top spot, but that's a solid. Like I'll take Mel again. Melody Collard is what Robert Cash is on the men's side. Like I'll take her and anyone as a doubles pairing and feel confident in my chances. Shake and Subash are eleven and two and eight and one at the two spot feel really good about that pairing. Now, it's very clear Coach O'Leary's looking for a three-double sp- squad. She's played six different pairings uh, at that position. Navarro and Ziodato, two and one. Ziodato and Shu three and four. But it's clear that's where the search is. Just listen to these numbers in singles, though. Travinsky, 13 and one. Collard, she's been really sneaky good at six. She's 13 and one. Shake, 10 and two. Ziodato, 13 and two. Subash is the weak point at seven and five, and she's now seven and three at the number three spot. You know, Shu is eight and four overall, but she, if you can get eight and four out of number one with everyone else doing their thing elsewhere, like, you're right. We need to see some more significant data points. We need to see a tougher strength of schedule moving forward, but you can only play the opponent lined up against you. And again, in a conference that has been filled with a lot of uncertainty, North Carolina faced a team match point against Miami. Florida State, uh, who did they just beat at home? Pretty co- They beat Georgia Tech soundly, soundly at home on Friday. Like, in a conference that has otherwise been really funny this year, Virginia's like, nah, we're not going to do that today. We're just going to kill you. Like, okay, you won a doubles point. That's cute, but we just won five first sets. So, like, don't think you have a chance against us. That's what they did to Georgia Tech in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. They're just, they are very good. I don't know if they're great, 
but they are very good. They are a top eight team. Like, that's just what a top eight team looks like, I suppose, Jay. That would be my final thought on them. Any final response? Are you ready to talk about their best win? <laughs> that's a nice transition to Pepperdine. Yeah, exactly. Let's move on to our next topic. Again, Virginia's best win this season, first-round national indoors. They knocked off Pepperdine, a team who has just stayed hot in the month since. And again, since the national indoors day, just listen to this Pepperdine resume. Pepperdine team now 10-3 overall. They've won their last nine consecutive ma- oh no 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 they lost to Michigan mm. so I apologize for that that's incorrect but you look at what they've done since the national indoors they are six and one overall wins over Auburn Florida Ohio State Cal USC and LMU a loss for two to Michigan on the road indoors as well again this team may lose indoor matches they've lost like three outdoor matches in the last four seasons 4-1 over Cal uh, last uh, excuse me, 6-1 over Cal last weekend, now 4-0 over USC this weekend. Again, they take the doubles point. They don't lose at three ever. Janice Chen, another victory there. Czar gets a straight set win. She had to grind out at one. And then big clinch for Nikki Redelick to pull out that win in straight sets where things were getting competitive elsewhere. Charney and Brodus were in three. Campana was serving, I think, to stay alive in the match. Did have an opportunity to close out that second set, but wasn't able to do so. They were going three sets on six as well, where, by the way, Pepperdine continues to get better again. Just I, I was putting together resumes as looking at my rankings, and head-to-head still means something to me, so I had Virginia above Pepperdine, but that Pepperdine resume, two USC wins, two Cal wins, Ohio State, Auburn, Florida, that's seven really good wins for this team to build off of moving forward, and obviously with San Diego being as good as they are this year, to know they'll have two shots against them as well, like... They should be able to play outdoors for the first three rounds of the NCAA tournament, which is the thing they just need to guarantee more than anything else. They shouldn't have to leave Malibu, Jay, 4-0 over the Trojans. That's a very impressive win. Yeah, they're cooking out there in Malibu. And not only will they get San Diego likely twice, but they also still have matches on the schedule again with Cal, with UCLA and Stanford. So they're a little light right now on their eight and nine wins. But you think if they get two of those wins, they're going to be a sure bet for top eight and have no issues with that. Get to host something that they haven't been able to do. Uh, Certainly not last year. They had to go indoors at Texas. That's something they want to avoid this year, but they're looking really strong. And I think we're getting to that stage where how much weight do we put in that Virginia win over Pepperdine indoors back in, you know, six weeks ago when, this Pepperdine seems looking a lot different outdoors. No, again, they're two and a half points up on everyone. They're going to win two of the top three. Czar, Chen, Brodus, like they're taking two of those top three. Chen and Brodus don't lose ever at the number one spot, but they're getting better at two and three doubles as well. Like two has been really reliable. And then three, yeah. you feel like Czar and anyone, that team should be competitive, should put enough balls in play to at least give time for their one and two to run away with things. Again, whether it's Conway or Vivian Young of late, they've been playing a lot better ball at six. Redelick, Campana, uh, Campana continue to get more and more comfortable as well. And it's not just, you know, placeholders. Again, Redelick with a clinch this weekend over a deep USC team. So uh, the ways are just good. Like they're not just five players anymore. And I don't think their pathway is as limited as it was indoors. Like, or it's, I shouldn't say five players. I, sh- I meant to say they have four out of five chances. Like they had to win four out of the top five singles flights. It felt like at national indoors doubles wasn't oh, they where had, it needed they, to be. They had to win doubles and sweep top three. And then the doubles wasn't where it needed to be. So they didn't win their matches. Exactly. And it just feels like their pathway is broadened now. Like there's just a yeah, lot more 100%. confidence is what I'm trying to say in all the other points as well. Yep. And the top three have stayed as good. So what does that mean, Jay? It, in layman's terms, they've gotten better, which is all you can ask for in a season like this. And so again, that's a really good win for Pepperdine. USC was pretty competitive, though. Like, I just want to be clear. I know that loss says 4-0, but they were up at 5. They won the first set at 6. Charney was up a set on Savannah at 2 as well. That second set between Han and Czar was really competitive at 1. USC is top 16 good. And again, after a lot of uncertainty surrounding the West Coast, Pepperdine, San Diego, Stanford, USC, UCLA, those are, what, 6 right there? That should be 6 top 16 teams. Like, then... Honestly, they've all beaten up on each other enough to where... And Cal. I don't think I mentioned Cal. So there's a seventh. Like, they've all beaten up enough on each other to where I wonder how the points are going to shake out. If there would even be room for all seven teams 
to be in the top 16 because they're all in that conversation. Yeah, I still count six, but what did uh, I get missing? The... Hold on, Stanford, Pepperdine, Cal, San Diego, USC, UCLA. That's six. That's Midwest math for you. Yeah, yeah that's the Michigan education. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know because like a Cal, a UCLA, a San Diego, they're all flirting right now with sixteen, but it's going to help a lot of them. Again, we talked about this last week. Pepperdine is going to be a huge win for some of these teams if they're able to get it. So. They all have the options moving forward. Now that conference tournament, the Pac-12 tournament is going to have a lot of points in it. So there's very much a path forward for all of them. It's a matter of if what other conferences do as well. I was looking at the resumes peripheral. for all of them. Cal right now is 11 and three. San Diego right now 10 and four. UCLA right now is like six and two. No, nine and three overall, but they've won seven in a row. Uh, this USC team currently 13 and five. USC's got the best resume or the most complete resume of the bunch. But it's like, but San Diego beat USC. UCLA beat USC. Cal beat Oklahoma on the road and looked really competitive at the national indoors as well. They've all lost to Pepperdine, by the way. Like, it's just, it's really fascinating as you try to sort out all of the resumes of those West Coast teams as well and try to compare who should be above whom in the ranking, something we will discuss here in a moment. But before we do that, Jay, I want to talk about, again, uh, dare I say, some teams who may not be in the national championship conversation, but teams who I thought had really good weekends who are worth exploring as we wrap up our look here at week number 11. And you see them all to the side. I mentioned Florida State earlier. Starting to come to life. And again, that's a team with a lot of experience. Allen, Arcadianu, Scope, like Bissett, like just players who have been around for some time. And for them to 6 1 Georgia Tech, 4 love a Clemson team that has been on the wrong end of a lot of 4 threes, but plays just about everyone 4 3. They're not top 16 resume. But Florida State's getting into the tournament. And again, there was a moment where they were outside the top 40. That just shouldn't be the case moving forward. This team should be in round two and a, a tough opponent for any host team in round two of the NCAA tournament. Yeah, they have really struggled with injuries. Yeah. And for them to be fully healthy, it's good to see. It feels like that's always been plaguing them late stages. So hopefully they continue to be healthy. And this is very much a team that you – could see having an upset in that very chaotic ACC tournament, which I'm sure we'll be getting soon. Yeah, and in my quest to remain biased as always, I love Coach Hyde, always one of my favorites. And so, again, really happy you're right, just given all the injuries that program has dealt with over the last few seasons to see them healthy and having success once again. So shout out to them. Shout out to Baylor. Like, their continued success as we've moved through Big 12 play just continues to consolidate the position in my head, Jay, that Grand Canyon's really good. And we don't talk about that enough and how close they were to beating Baylor. But 4-3 over Kansas, 5-2 over Iowa State. That's a good win for the Baylor Bears, who should no longer be in jeopardy of missing the NCAA tournament either. Yeah, I mean, you would expect them to win those matches. Yeah. Um, so they're they're definitely getting better. They started the season really slow. Yeah, huge weekend for Virginia Tech. Six one yes. over Syracuse, four three over Boston College. Those are really fun matches as well, Jay. I like this Hokies team. Well, I mean, now that the NC State points are you know percolating throughout the ACC thanks to the <laughs> yeah, Syracuse win, this is huge for Virginia Tech. Now they're still not within striking distance of making the tournament, but they move up twenty spots inside inside the top sixty. So. There's at least some more hope here for the the bottom tier of the ACC. Yeah, it was a huge Sunday in general. Again, the women beat Syracuse comfortably. The men beat Miami 4-3 on the road. It was just exciting. Again, it's a Virginia Tech program. They lost their men's assistant, unfortunately, passing away in the fall. And to just see the program rally, it's a really feel-good story. And, yeah, they were, the women just they were straight up better than both BC and Syracuse this weekend. And you got to defend your home courts in ACC play from one win to three wins now on the conference. Big win for TCU. Again, they sweep Iowa State, Kansas this weekend as well as they try to get back in NCAA uh, competition or qualifying mode. Maryland, two must-have wins over Michigan State. Princeton win 4-3 in particular. Impressive, even though they dropped the one to Michigan. Did take the doubles point in that. We're up one love, but good weekend for the Terps. Good weekend for Memphis. Wins over FAU, VCU 4-3, VCU 4-2 over FAU as well. But just some tournament notes there. Any final thoughts on this group, Jay? The sneaky good results, as I like to call them? 
No, I like your picks. I appreciate it. Well, then last but not least, as we look back at week number 12, 12, 11 of this season, week number 11, that graphic, again, well, we'll fix it as we move forward next week. But just some some other results to note. A&M, a 2-0 weekend as they beat Kentucky and Vandy. Georgia, dare I say, a top five resume win for them. Pulled off this weekend as they beat Tennessee 4-1. Florida gets a sweep. Arizona, Arizona State, each beating Oregon. Cal just putting wins on the board as they beat Utah, Colorado pretty handily as top teams do. You know, again, kind of shaping up the Big Ten race of who's going to be in NCAA tournament competition mode. Northwestern sweeping Iowa and Nebraska. Looks like they're going to be one of those teams competitive for a spot. Illinois got a big win over Nebraska, but then Iowa knocking off Illinois 4-2. That keeps the Hawkeyes intriguing. SMU beat USF. USF beat Charlotte. Charlotte beat SMU. I just thought the symmetry of those three were all pretty funny as well, Jay. But other than that, oh, Ole Miss 5-2 over Alabama. That was really the first dare I say, bad loss the Tide have taken this season. Arkansas 4-1 over a shorthanded South Carolina team I didn't mention either. That's everything I saw week number 11 of the season. Jay, anything else you want to add? Well, you saw a lot. I would just double down <laughs> on I do really see a tough, really tough loss for South Carolina. Only have four, four players in singles. No Ackley at the top there. If for a team that was flirting with the top 16, that will really hurt them. And I thought Texas A&M, I mean, they crushed Vanderbilt. That was 7-0. It was, they didn't drop a set. Yeah. And I thought that they're starting to show that they can hang there at the top of that SEC conference. Yeah, again, it, it was a really fun week 11 outside of that ACC weekend. Not too many upsets, but again, positions being consolidated, as they should, by the way, at the end of month number three of a season. That said, that's your look at week 11 of this year. And with another week in the book, Jay, We've got rankings for everyone to enjoy. Again, new rules in place. And once again, unfortunately, we're a voter short. Nevertheless, as we are five wide, we have our new Cracked Rackets rankings for everyone. By the way, Jay, we might have to bring the executive committee together. If I bring Nicholas Gruskin in as an emergency fill-in rankings replacement, is that acceptable to you? Because I, I was telling you this beforehand. He was texting me. I got two texts today. He goes, one, what's up with all things San Diego, men's and women's tennis? Two, he goes, who is Antoine Cornut Chauvin? He's like, who is this guy? Why don't I know about him? I was like, you should know about him, Nick. Anyways, is that qualification enough? What sort of What's the next question he has to ask to earn a voting spot? Oh, that's a really good question. I feel like it's got to uh, be something history related because I always get him with history questions. Like, again, he was giving me his list of all-time guys he'd want at 3 all, and he included 2019 Free Sokos, which you know I've just beaten into him. And like, 2019 mm-hmm. National Endorsed Petros Free Sokos is still the single greatest individual. Pro- I've never seen a man just be like, I'm winning in 20 minutes, and I'm going to make you win next to me as well. I've just I've never seen anyone else have a performance like that. Others have come close. Anyways, like I need something like that out of him. Okay, well, I don't know how much that would impact his ability to <laughs> rank our women's teams. Can he name the person in this graphic? No chance. There's no chance he would know that. So then, Novak. No, no way. Then, then, but no, let me ask you her. this. How many people out there in the world can name the person on that graphic? doesn't matter that that how doesn't like them is, are... isn't it yeah that's true that are we asking to be voters <laughs> that's we're a good point we're not asking that's the world point. to vote in the cr poll but, here but i'm saying if i told him that was christina novak he would be aware of who that is like so that's the difference could he identify them by sight yet no if it was a picture of julia he'd be like oh that's julia um or if it was annika he'd be like oh that's annika because he grew up with both of them but like yeah i think to vote in the poll you should be able to recognize by a picture someone from the number one team in said poll. I think I should have waited to answer that, and I apologize, but we're going to do this moving forward now. This is going to be our new rankings bit. Westoff's going to put in a new picture every week, and we're going to open it up to the chat. First person to identify gets a shout-out on the show, and we'll figure out something else. But I want to put this theory to the test, Jay, because I really like it. Like That's fascinating. How many people can identify? You know what? first person to identify five photos correctly maybe you get to vote in one week of the poll maybe that will be the reward we give you once you get five correctly because we i need a sample size i I can't just like draw one name and it might just be your team anyways let's see where your team is ranked and how our rankings compare to the ita top 10 right now the ita top 10 is as follows number 10 nc state who 
you see is in our number 10 spot. Number 9, they have USC. USC received votes, just missed out on our top 10 in our number 10 spot, uh, 9 spot. We have A&M, who's number 13 in the computer rankings. We have UNC 8. The computer has UNC 8. We have Georgia 7. The computer has them 4 in the ITA rankings. Texas is number 7. They're obviously at our number 5 spot. We have Pepperdine at 6. Computer rankings has them at 3. Again, Texas at 5. Computer rankings has them at 7. Virginia's our number 4. Computer has them at 6. Stanford's our 3. Computer has them at 5. We agree with the top 2. Michigan still number 2. Oklahoma State undefeated still our number 1 team, J. Again, I think head-to-head matters. I have Virginia over Pepperdine in my individual rankings. I'm still very high on Texas. I was breaking down their resume. I really like it. Like, again, they've been right there with Oklahoma State twice. Their other loss to a Stanford team that at Stanford, we know how good they are. Oh, that was at Stanford, right? Not in Austin. Mm-hmm. That was played, yeah, yeah. At, at Stanford. Stanford. You know, again, they have a win over Oklahoma. They have a win over Ohio State. They have a win over A&M. They have some really good wins on the resume is what I'm trying well, to say. Well, the win over Georgia. A win over Georgia. Well, Thank you really as well. Them. They're still my number four team in my individual rankings for what it's worth. I have them just above Virginia, who I have at that number five spot. Then after that, I go uh, Pepperdine's my six, Georgia seven. Eight, nine, and ten was the hardest thing for me. What do I do with the A&M, UNC, NC State trio? Like, I just... Again, head-to-head matters to me, and NC State's beaten UNC twice. They also lost at Oklahoma. They also lost to Michigan twice. Like They also lost at Syracuse, which is probably the worst loss of the bunch, but A&M's lost to UCLA. A&M lost to San Diego. Like, A&M has some blemishes on its record as well. UNC beat Georgia, but not this current UNC team. And so is that enough to put them behind this Texas A&M team, who certainly has better wins than this iteration of UNC does, although the Miami UNC, uh, and Florida State win still pretty good for UNC. The resumes of 8, 9, and 10, I had no idea what to do with. Georgia at 7 wasn't much above 8, 9, and 10 for me either. I felt pretty locked in in my top six in my order with them. I feel right about these 10 teams as well. They're my 10. Spoiler alert, they're Jay's 10 teams as well. Let him reveal the order, but I kind of like this. Like, again, I don't don't hate where we're at right now. I think the last two spots for top eight seeds are seriously up for grabs. Well, I think that is very much true. This is actually not my top 10. It's my top nine, but uh, I do not have NC State. Oh, you have Cal at 10. I apologize. Good reading, Alex. Yeah. I have, I have Cal in there. Pretty good math skills. Michigan education on blast today. I apologize, Wolverines. But yeah, I think I think these top seven are very solid. And I think that North Carolina is the wild card. Like they could end up being a top three there. They could end up being out eight where they are now. And then I do think you have a whole handful of teams that are fighting for nine and 10 who are going to look to squeak up into the top eight. But yeah, I don't have any issues with this. It's uh, NC State. It's like, you know, one step forward, one and a half steps back. Here's the thing. If I'd have told you in December that NC State has two UNC wins, you'd be like, oh, they're unequivocally the number one team in the country. Like they're two no Brant Meyer and singles UNC wins. But still, that has to be a top 10 resume. Like for me, that has to put you in the top 10, even if you lost to Syracuse the way they did, even with the road loss to Oklahoma uh, the way they had it as well. Like two UNC wins freaking matter, even with the loss to Duke at home as well. I hadn't mentioned that either in their resume, but it's just like I had to have them there and there were two of them. So I put them at eight actually. And then I put UNC at nine. And then I put A&M at 10 just because I still have some SEC questions. Like, as we've discussed, is the SEC as good as we thought it might be entering this season? Is anyone as good as we thought they might be entering the season? I think Michigan's exactly as good as we thought they would be entering the season. Everyone else has either exceeded or, dare I say, undersold their expectations. And so I think I think Michigan's better. I mean, no, did... they're better relative to results, but they are the team I thought they would be, if that makes sense. Like, that team in the broader ecosystem or hierarchy ranks higher than maybe we thought preseason, but like they're good where we thought they'd be good. They are who we thought that, you know, to quote, uh, what is it? Dennis green. They are who we thought they were like, they kind of are. 
Yeah, I mean, Charney's been the big upside. Yeah, I think sure. she's clicked way more than you maybe expected a freshman to. So, like, I give them a slight edge and sort of over exceeding. Everyone else has been well, sort of what we expected. Notorious Michigan underseller John J. Parsons. I'm not shocked to hear they've exceeded your expectations. But, you know, again, top eight frisky. You see that? The face he made on me. Now that we're back on YouTube, you all can see the faces John makes at me at times. So that's really <laughs> what I was trying to invoke. But, yeah, I mean, look, like, Oklahoma State's exceeded expectations, obviously. Stanford's kind of status quo. Like, kind of are who we thought they were, still waiting to see them make a move. But, like, semifinals of indoors, lost to Oklahoma State tight. That's about who – I mean, that it's Oklahoma State's the name. But if I said semifinal loss to national indoor champion at the national indoors, like, that kind of felt like where Stanford should be. Again, we don't have to do this for every team. But yeah. certainly some overselling under so – again, I like the, these rankings right now. I agree. Yeah. And so with that said, that's your look at week number 11 and where things stand after it. Now let's look ahead to week number 12 on the schedule. Obviously, I always like to divide things tier one, tier two matches, some honorable mentions we can get to, but two big ones in ACC play this weekend to look forward to. Now, both of them are on off broadcasting days. NC State at UVA, a Thursday match. UNC at Duke, a Saturday match. Am I selfishly very upset that I don't get to call both? Of course I am. Nevertheless, Jay, I guess that removes the burden of fearful of not making predictions about each of these schools here today. Let's start with NC State at UVA because it's the who's first real test since the national indoors. It's a home test for them as well. The thing is, they get a riled up NC State team. It's not like they get to rest off their laurels after a 2-0 home weekend. No, they're coming off of a loss to Duke, so... They got something to prove as well. They kind of need this win to get back into the top eight hunt, particularly with those Duke-Syracuse losses sitting on their resume. This is a fascinating match, Jay. What's your lean? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, this is a tough one because I do like NC State on the bookends. I think one and, well, I got to go. I'll lean Virginia because this is at Virginia. And if this is outdoors, it can get windy there. NC State, maybe not as familiar with it. And I think Virginia just going to be too solid. I I think they will get a win at at Renchelli. They will get a win over Abrams. That's two, and they can find two more. I think the path for them is very similar to Duke. I think everyone now sees the path against NC State. You hope to take doubles. If not, you attack at two through five because NC State's really good at the corners. The thing is, UVA is really good two through five. Like, Ziadato, Shake, Sub- uh, I guess Subash, um, Travinsky, they, like, that's, yeah. that's the money makers for this yeah. Virginia squad. They should be favored in all of those matchups, given they're at home, given the recent form of the Wolf Pack. That said, again, hell hath no fury, though, like an NC State team scorned. And this is UVA's first big test, like, where you're the favorite in a matchup like this. I think the Wolfpack sneak it out 4-3. I do. That said, if Virginia wins this one again, they ensconce themselves firmly in the inner circle moving forward. What about UNC at Duke? Like, Duke wins this. It is a narrative change on their season moving forward. Now they've beaten two of their fellow, or all three of their fellow four North Carolina, all three of their fellow North Carolina squads, excuse me, um, God, the math is just off today, Jay. The pressure of being live. Um, they've been pretty good. Again, they have, like, Kim He at two has been really good. Kod at four has been really good. Schvetz at five has been really good. They got to find their fourth point from there, but UNC's got some questions. How healthy is Tran coming into this matchup? Are you going to be relying on two freshmen on the road in Durham in their first UNC-Duke matchup? Like, Again, after watching Kelly Chen beat Fiona Crawley in Durham, Duke can do anything against the Tar Heels in this matchup at home. What's your read on this one? What are you expect? What are you most looking forward to? Well, it's hard because there's no reason on paper North Carolina shouldn't win this match. Mm-hmm. But the intangibles, I feel like lean Duke here. Like I feel like they're going to be riding a lot of confidence from that NC State win. And realize they have a great opportunity to strike here. I can't see him getting it done. It's going to be really good. Twice. So, yeah, I'm going to go UNC. But if not, I don't want to do another 30 minutes on panic button for UNC next week. (laughs) Well, we will if they lose that match. And we'll have to talk about the deviations. What should that lineup look like moving forward? 
Is it a must win? A must win match for UNC? Shocking to say, but like kind of a must win match for the Tar Heels. Yeah, to... It's certainly a must not lose. Yeah. It... Now, semantics argue that's the same thing. No, but... that's not the same. And I actually would agree with you. It's a must not lose because then you start to get worried about this group moving forward. And can they find that Tar Heel magic that they've found for a decade plus now uh, to be competitive come May? I think the Tar Heels take it. I'm going to take them 4-2, but again, I do think that match is going to be competitive everywhere. And then last but not least, Jay, in Tier 1, the California Swing. UCLA, USC headed up to North Cal to take on Stanford and Cal. I assume there might just be a John Jay Parsons appearance at each of those Stanford matches this weekend. What's your read on this quad? Who comes out 2-0, 1-1, 0-2? What are you seeing? Well, we've been getting great weather here in the Bay Area, and it's going to be great after Friday and Saturday. So I'm very worried. There's rain in the forecast Uh-oh. for both of these matches. That's typical for so, Cal. They don't play matches. They get rained out matches. Yeah, and that would be a, that would be terrible. I I'd be don't know so the, mad. I agree. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know what the Pac-12 makeup schedule is, but we ha- we have to play them. These are crucial for all of these schools. Now, assuming we get we get these matches, I do think Stanford goes two and zero. Uh, I think that they have options everywhere. I think they'll, they could very well lose a doubles point in each of these matches, but I think they can find four singles. Very curious about the Cal matchups. I think I think Cal loses to UCLA and beats USC. Interesting. I, look, Stanford goes 2-0 in, in this. Um, it's going to be really good. Like, Stanford needs a big weekend. This is their first test in a little bit, in about a month, I'd say, for the Cardinals to get pushed by two top 16 teams. I mentioned the UCLA resume. They are 9-3 and three overall. That's not a ton of matches under their belt. They beat a Cal. Again, that's a win that's going to be on their ranked wins as they try to cement a top 16 resume. USC has the most margin to put together an 0-2 weekend, I actually think, of any of these teams. Like, it matters less for them given the resume they've already accomplished, Michigan, Miami, Tennessee wins, etc., compared to the rest of the group, who's just the resumes might be a little bit more lacking. That said, they're probably also the most battle-tested of all of these groups as well, maybe outside of Stanford. I want to know how good UCLA is. And if they go 1-1 one one this weekend, it means they are top 16 good. If both Stanford and Cal go 2-0, and uh, Cal goes 2-0, and keep them in the top 16 of my rankings for the rest of the season. You would expect Stanford to go 2-0. The only thing notable would be if they don't. You know, again, if USC gets another win, you add a Cal-Stanford win to the Miami-Tennessee-Michigan wins. I'm sure I'm missing others from their resume as well. They also have a uh, two wins over Washington, um, yeah. another shot to beat UCLA later in the season, a Pepperdine match later in the season starting to look like a top 16 if not better resume perhaps for the Trojans if they can end their season strong this it's a huge weekend out west like these are tone setting matches for the rest of the Pac-12 season so very exciting tier one Stanford 2-0 and I don't want to take USC or UCLA to go 0-2 but I don't think Cal goes 0-2 either I'm just going to take the home teams. When in doubt, take the home teams. That's my philosophy this year. Stanford, Cal, each go 2-0. Some wow. other fun ones, Stan- San Diego at Washington. Must win match for San Diego if they're going to be top 16. Georgia's at Alabama and Auburn. How real is that state of Alabama success? Tennessee, same road trip. Let's find out if Auburn and Alabama can each go 1-1. One one. You feel like it's a successful weekend. Northwestern at Illinois. You lose that, you're probably not getting into the NCAA tournament. And then Penn at Princeton, similar huge Ivy League uh, implications in that one as well. Anything else you'd add to the Week 12 resume or any thought, final thoughts on that, Jay? No, these look good. All right. Well, then last but not least here, you've now heard about Week 11. You've seen towards Week 12. Let's have a little fun, Jay, to wrap today's show. Let's offer a thought experiment for all of our fans tuning in or those, whether it be via our YouTube channel or at home. The one thing, obviously, you don't get to do in tennis period, except for world team tennis or at the collegiate level. We don't actually have trades. You don't have that. I guess the transfer portal are player-driven trades. You can swap from one roster to another. But, of course, coaches can't say, hey, we'll offer you this player for X and Y. It'd be really cool if they could. And in that spirit, 
we can certainly do that. We can have the thought experiment here on this show. So, Jay, given the uncertainty at the top of college tennis, given, again, outside of Oklahoma State, it feels like everyone could still use a piece or two to try and cement their places moving forward. I spent about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, coming up with some trades. I narrowed it down to my best four, although two of them involve one team, so we'll call it best three and a half here. I just... I want to throw some thoughts at you. I want to throw some thoughts at the listeners. I obviously would love for any of them who have ideas, tweet them at us, at, J- at JTweetsTennis, at A.L. Gruskin, at Crack Rackets. Feel free, free to throw them in the chat as well. Maybe we can do new trades every week because I do think I could come up with three new ones each and every week. But I've got three fascinating ones to start. One I've thrown your way before, but one I think would just make this season that much more intriguing. And... With that said, before I get to it, Jay, any thoughts as we approach this exercise? Well, let's just set the ground rules. So these are players that we're going to swap between teams. Yes. You would need to take the player for the duration of their collegiate tenure. Correct. You get that now for the duration of their tenure. So a freshman, you get for three and a half more years versus a senior, you'd only get for two more months. Yep. And we decide which school would kind of like this trade, not like this trade, we adjudicate that. Yes. Well, I'm asking you to adjudicate that. Because, Which is uh, much better role than me coming up I with I agree. These, so this is, no, this is what we were meant to do. Is me? I come up with the trades and why I think both teams would say yes, and you tell me whether you agree or disagree. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you what I've said, what coaches have said what, but I texted them some coaches, and they were intrigued by the exercise. So we may this may be a recurring segment here on the show yeah, moving forward. Coaches like this one. You threw it out, and a few people said, said, hey, I, that's interesting. Well, it is interesting. It would <laughs> yeah. be fascinating. So let's get to it. Here's the headliner. Right. And we've talked about it. There's one piece I think every national uh, championship contending team, including Oklahoma State, if she is put on the table, on the trade table, you take the call and you start to scheme amongst the coaching staff. Okay, who would we be comfortable giving up for this player? And you know who that player is, Jay. It's Michigan senior Gala Mesaharito, who is just the gal, the gala right now. Like, she's the one, 3-2, your team's down. She's down a set in 4-2. Don't worry. She's turning it around. She's finding a way to win her match in three sets. She's going to put a point on the board when her team needs her most. She's the piece I would want above all else. She's starting to work in some doubles contributions as well. But she's just like that supplemental final piece you get that makes a national championship team whole. And what team needs that boost of that culture addition that just never say die back against the wall? I know she's going to come through more than anything else. Well, it's a North Carolina team that is just searching for that continuity, that is searching for that certainty as they head towards another May stretch. A Carolina team right now that, by the way, knows this is the end of a decade run. This is the culmination of everything Coach Calbus has been working towards for 10 years. The, all the national indoor success, you win your first NCAA title, you have Scotty, Forbes, Yarlagata, Crawley, Tran, this generation of seniors that have brought more success than any class of players ever to the women's tennis program at UNC. They're all still two more months on the job. And I just think if you have the opportunity to go all in with this roster, Coach Calbus, who will know maybe more acutely than any other coach in the country, how fleeting those opportunities are. For 10 years, he was knocking on the door. Took until 2023 for him to get there. This is the sort of group. This is the sort of moment. This is the sort of team you just go all in on. And so without Reese Brantmeyer, what do they have on the trade table? As I said earlier, they're still eight deep. Crawley, Tran, Forbes, Yarlagata, Tan Gillig, Evans, Tatum, uh, Evans, Tatum, Evans, Rabman, and I'm missing, and Scotty. Those are their eight pieces. So there's still some trade room there for them to consolidate things. If I'm Brian Calbus, I call Ronnie Bernstein and I say, Ronnie, I know your team's really good this year. I know this team made a national indoor final, something you've never done. Jaden, Kari, Gala, the senior class, it's mean a lot for them to stay together. I get it. But what if instead of that, instead of this being the culmination, what if you now have a three-year runway if you're Michigan? 
and you do a two-for-one swap, and we say, we're giving you our future if you're UNC. We'll give you both Evans and Rabman, two freshmen, to add to the pieces of Jones, Charney, Fliegner moving forward. We'll give you two freshmen to throw in there, and I, mi- and I missed a piece for Michigan, I think, as well there. I apologize. No, 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 I didn't because the rest are seniors. We'll give you two freshmen to supplement the loss of Mesajarito, so you're still going to be six deep. Two freshmen, and we'll take Gala. And now the six-year rollout, if you're UNC, Crawley, Scotty, Gala, Tangillig, Yarlagata, Tran. Seniors, sorry, I'm going to swear, fucking everywhere. Like, this UNC team, you're saying, we are all in on this season. We know this is the end of the run. Let's be one of those special groups. Let's go back to back. If you're Michigan, do you sell a little bit of this season? Probably, because Evans Rabman aren't who Gala is right now. But you're still very much six deep. You still have a lot of choices. And again, now moving forward, you've got four pieces, Jones, Charney, Rabman, Evans. They are all underclassmen this year. The runway is just extended for Michigan to remain a comfortable top eight program and continue to supplement that elite tennis moving forward, making everything easier. It's a tough sell, Jay, but I do think it's a win-win 10,000-foot view who says yes? Who says no? Well, I can tell you have given this a lot, a lot of, of thought. thought. <laughs> Three months. This whole exercise might have been just to have this trade. So I think UNC makes this trade for sure. The all in think... notion making sense, right? Like that's the logic. Yes. But on the flip side, it feels all in this season as well for Michigan. Because they have seniors throughout as well. Yeah. They have Jaden Brown. They have Kari Miller. The, the This has been the culmination of their work. And so I don't think Michigan makes this trade. Yeah. Because I do think they really deprive themselves of a real shot of winning the NCAA title this year. So I don't think Coach so, Bernstein makes that trade. So I thought you might say that because they're both freshmen, and here's my counter. What if instead of one, you get to pick whomever of Rabman and Evans you like more, and then instead of that, the third piece you get back is Yarlagata. And so the Michigander comes home, and now, again, UNC gets to keep one of their freshmen, but they give up a fifth year instead. So you get to keep that experience if you're Michigan, and it's like, and we get a new piece for the future. But we lose this. They're probably not giving up Annika in that trade, though. That's the whole thing. That now UNC probably says no. But that yeah, would maybe I mean, the, be the counter back. Yeah, I mean the UNC stuff hinged upon keeping fifth year Yarlagata yeah. in that lineup, right? Yeah. That was the argument. So, I mean, I like those four pieces to build around for Michigan. But at the same time, Coach Bernstein's been able to recruit really well, and she's yeah. going to be able to recruit really well after they potentially win a national championship this year. So I think she's all in with this team. I, it wouldn't, I mean, practically you just, so you don't sell Gala. If Michigan lost in the quarterfinals of the indoors, this trade makes more sense, but you're right. They made the finals. They're two in the country. They've beaten NC state twice. Like they know this Oklahoma state team so well. That's the problem is this team has real like national championship doors open. And yeah. you just don't close that, even if it means extending the window being open for two to three more years. That said, oh. like, that's a really good four pieces. And you know Ronnie's going to land at least one or two more blue chips during their next hypothetical two years together. So that's where it's like, ooh. I, that's why I think if you're Michigan, you have the conversation, though, right? Like, you bring in Kari. You bring in Jaded. You say, Gala, you're on the trading block, so you're not coming into this meeting. But I just think, like, I think you, you'd look like you, wouldn't you have would, would you take the meeting is what I'm saying. If you're Ronnie, do you have well, a conversation? You always pick up the phone. Yeah, I, it's just that's a really good trade to me. All right. There are more fake gala trades I could do. We'll save another new one for next week. By the way, I'm. Some Michigan alums might want to keep Gala on their team. I don't think I was going to say alum anymore. I'm just thinking as a fun thought exercise, but I'm just saying. Yeah, the problem is the bar to sell Gala is it, it might not be quantifiable. Yeah, but there might not be a You're price. trading a dollar bill for two seventy five cent pieces though. Like that's the thing where it's like you are gaining back two real pieces if you're Michigan. But it's a bird in the hand, right? Yeah, I mean I Evans and Radman come over. But two they, in the bush literally. It would be yeah. two in the bush. Uh, you you're not gonna bet on the future for something you have right. now. Well, 
with that said, let's move then to trade number two. And that was my okay. favorite of the trades. This is the trade package I call the Lee Sharabura package, which I actually think if trades were allowed in college tennis, this would be the trade. Like, this is the most desirable trade package in the country because Lee's a senior, Sharabura's a junior. Georgia Tech is good, but not going anywhere that significant right now this year. So if you had the young pieces to go get them, dare I say the Radman Evans package? Like again, I think that's another. That I think that's a definite yes, yes for both teams. Like that's yeah. A, see, now you're talking about a team that's willing to kind of give up some of the the season. That's what now. I'm saying. And so again, if you're you, would you do that if you're UNC Evans and Radman for Lee and Charbura and be like, we have Lee now in the mix. It's another fifth year. Her and Charbura are a doubles team to go with Crawley and Tan Gillig, and now it's Scotty and a floater at three. Like. I think you probably yeah. say yes to that trade package too. I, the yeah, thing I is, that might North be Carolina, too much. Like, if you're North Carolina, you're like, ah, uh, I don't. I like. Well, well, I don't know because yeah. where are we? I think they Carroll? would take. I mean, I think they would just take Carroll. Yeah, but no, I'd right. want Sharabura too because I'd be like, I want that doubles component. Like, that's a really nice component to keep. Anyways, I made a rule with Jay that I broke within our first five minutes of me texting him the rule of can't have the same team twice. But I'm not going to do that, Lee. Even though we snuck it in there, anyways. Where did Lee and Sharborough go? I was looking for teams who had depth and had mm-hmm. some things they can trade but need a number one and are just like a top-tier player away to where that, supplementing everything else in the lineup, now that team becomes really interesting. And so that's what I was looking for with, again, you bring in Carol Lee, you bring in that Sharborough piece for any depth you've lost, now she can slide into your six, and she's like 10-3 and three or 10-2 and two overall in the year, something crazy like that. And again, a doubles team with Carol Lee ready-made for you. So that's why I wanted to package them together is you get a one and a six that allows you to give up more pieces. I had two teams I thought of that would be perfect for that sort of addition. Florida and Auburn were the two I was looking at. I was like, how can it's I not get not the Lee? team I thought you were going to go with. Really? Who'd you think I was going to go with? USC. You know, I, they were on my list of teams I was going to look for trading pieces for. We'll save that for next week. Tell me which package you like better, or if you like neither, if you're Georgia Tech. The Auburn package, I don't know if she's coming back to school after she won the Africa Games. Shout out to her. But Georgia Tech receives Okatoye, Carnicella, and Adeline Flack in return for Carolee and Charabura. Who says no? No, no, Georgia Tech would say absolutely. I agree. It wasn't enough. And if you swap (laughs) in, the problem is if you put in Bennett, though, then Auburn's like, well, what's the point? Now we're just Lee and sorry, Arsenault. And like now we're too thin. Uh, And we have zero players for next year. That's what I'm saying. It wouldn't make (laughs) sense. So that's why I was trying to scheme it. That's what I thought. The package isn't enough. Florida gets Lee and Sharabura. They give up Kavia Lopez. It's a blue chip recruit. They give up Ravinska, another solid freshman, and they give up Ben to Spay. And now if you're Florida, Briggs, D'Oliviera, Galis, Lee, Sharabura, someone's got to step up and play six. Obviously, it implies health for them moving forward. But, like, I think I like that six. I mean, Kavi has been probably the most consistent contributor in their lineup in singles this year. But, like... Briggs, you know, again, moving everyone at the top of that Florida lineup down a spot does pay dividends. Now they have a real one in Lee as well. And I think I like that Florida team a little bit better. If you're Georgia Tech, you get Lopez and Ravinska out of it. Two pieces you can build around moving forward. You have another year with Spay as well. I think the Florida package is a little bit better. I would like to see Lee on Auburn, I think, a little bit more. Um, but I think the Florida deal is pretty good, Jay. I think the Florida deal they would take for this year, but then once they realize they don't have Kavia Lopez, yeah. who they're hoping to build around, that is where this becomes tough. And they only get Carol Lee for, you know, two months. And so you're talking the difference between a Florida team that makes a Sweet 16 versus maybe the Elite Eight. Yeah. And for a Florida program that's won NCAA titles, that doesn't really move the needle. That's why Auburn was the team. Like, they're kind of all in this year. How could I find a way to get Lee... Uh, Ansari, Arsenault, Bennett, and Sharabura as a five and be like, you can have anything else and then Ovunk maybe as my six or whatever it is. And it's just like, I just want that. That's why I was, again, trying to find the pieces for Auburn. They're just a little thin right now, unfortunately. So I wasn't able to do it. I'm going to keep finding the Lee Sharabura trade package because I think it's out there. And then last but not least, Jay, I know this show's gone a little long, but the last two teams, I think you're going to really like this one and just my thought process because – 
what do we say whenever we talk Pepperdine? They're two and a half points up. They're winning two of the top three, and yep. they're up half a flight in doubles. So how I'm do we find? Glad you went here. Yeah, how do I we find to think another point for Pepperdine? And mm-hmm. here's the thing, though: you can't trade Brodus or Chen because then not only do you lose one of them from your top three of the singles lineup, you lose them as a doubles pairing. So that was the hardest part for me. Is I wanted to trade. JT, but I was like, but I can't do that to Brodus. And so, like, that doesn't make sense. And so, am I really going to trade Lisa Czar? And I decided I really was going to trade senior Lisa Czar, which, again, sounds sacrilege because she's the spiritual connection to the 2021 finals team. And she would never be a trading piece for Pear, for Pete. They would never put her on the market. But let's just say this trade came up. Who has the sort of pieces, the sort of things that could make a Lisa Czar trade interesting? Hello, Texas Longhorns. Welcome to the conversation. Here's the trade, Jay. Pepperdine, or excuse me, Texas, gets Lee Cesar, Jasmine Conway, and if needed, Charlotte KP becomes eligible. We'll get to that in a second. That was just a little corollary I threw in there, like a late second rounder. Um, but Czar, Conway, to Texas. Pepperdine gets Rapalu and Uvrutsky. So now the Pepperdine six, yeah, you lost Czar, but it's... Brodus, Chen, Rapalu, Uvrutsky, Redelik, Campana. Where's the weak spot in that lineup, Jay? That's a really good six. If you're Texas, it's a little top heavy, but Zar, Zainalova, Sasnaskaya, Shavatapan, Pashkaleva, and again, this is why ideally in this scenario, Pepperdine offers you the money for the lawyer, Charlotte KP becomes eligible. If not, you get Jasmine Conway thrown in the six. Or, again, that's the problem is now Texas probably a player short. But I didn't hate this trade, Jay. What do you think? There are a lot of moving parts in this one. But I would say for this season, I think they both do it. I think so, right? Because, like, if you're Texas and it's Czar, like, you're rolling with that top five. You're like, we're winning four of those five for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and if you're Pepperdine, you're like, no one's going to beat that six four times. Like, if we can figure out a doubles point and we still have Brodus and JT up top, like, if we're up 1 0, no one's finding four against them because that is a deep six. Like, who's the weak spot? And Rapalu yeah. kind of like, will she be as good as JT has been at three? Maybe not, but she's been pretty darn close to it. Like, yeah. It's an yeah. interesting trade. This that's yeah. what I was like, hmm, because the best it, that's, pieces yeah. are, but the two better pieces go to Pepperdine, is Conway or Vivian Young, whomever you'd prefer. By the way, either freshman if you're Texas, you get naming rights to both. I think I do it. If I'm both I think teams, I think both that's do a it yes, this yes. season. Who says no yeah. long term, Texas? Why? Rapalu's a senior. Uvrutsky's a junior. Zar's a senior. Conway's a freshman. Like. Yeah, but Texas is losing a lot of pieces this year, yeah. and they uh, it does my joint come in as a freshman. Like they are going to have to find pieces, so they might that might be the concern on the Texas side. Um, but I do think do both teams get better in this instance? Like I think the answer might season, be yes. yes. Yeah, and so that's why it's an interesting trade. Like that was actually my yeah. sneaky favorite. I was like Pepperdine was the team I needed to find to do something with the big three. And if Zar's the piece you're giving up, like, you can demand some stuff back. And that's where, like, I mean, if you're – I don't think you – I don't think Evans and Radman for Zar straight up would be enough. Like, I think Pepperdine says no to that trade, right? Because what about that trade? Like, that – you would seize the team because they have the depth and the freshman pieces where they could be like, fine, we'll sell this season for this year. That's fine. Like, if your pair, would you do Zar for Evans and, and Radman straight up? Being like, and now we kind of have some pieces to build around next year because, again, Czar, Brodus, Chen, or Czar and Brodus in particular, and Redelic and Campana. Yeah, we just never know what's in the pipeline. I know. And they have a window (laughs) open. Again, this is why this is a fun segment. Uh, We could do this for hours. I have more trades in the queue. We'll save them for next week. Hour and a half for our debut YouTube show, Jay. I think that's probably a good place for us to leave things. Any final thoughts from you? Any no ad, no problem plugs you can offer us? I know you were on the road at Texas last week, right? No, I was not. <laughs> no, you had video from Texas. I did have video Definitely on the was. ground from Texas. Again, yes, you're our on-the-ground you. beat reporter. You got sources everywhere. 
Exactly. Yeah. I should have an interview with uh, Angela Okatoyi coming out awesome. soon, winner of the African Games. Excited to chat with her. So you can check out that. We'll do a preview of Michigan State, Illinois men mm. this coming weekend. We'll do that Sneaky, with Ethan. Huge so, Saturday match. There you go. That's why we chose it. <laughs> so, yeah, looking forward to those. Well, I look forward to listening to them. Obviously, again, everyone can follow you Twitter, Instagram at JTweetsTennis. Shout out to you. A, or no ad, no problem on Instagram, I believe is correct. the correct one. A shout out to you. A shout out, as always, to our super producer, Daniel Westoff. Makes all the graphics you saw on your screen tonight possible. And is the reason we can be back live on YouTube, where we will hopefully be each and every week for the remainder of this season. I know we got off to a late start, but you all see why. Uh, again, we wanted to make things right. We wanted to take things to the next level. I believe we have done that here this year. So if you're listening to the podcast this week, make sure you join us live on YouTube, 9 p.m. Eastern time, Tuesdays for the women, Wednesdays for the men, each and every Tuesday and Wednesday moving forward through the rest of this season. Also, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, we're going to be on ESPN+, Plus, SEC, ACC, Big 12 coverage. Make sure you check it out. Of course, Sundays, we've got our Big 10 cross-court cast on our YouTube channel as well. A lot of great matches down the home stretch to follow them all. Just follow our Crack Rackets broadcast. With that said, though, for all of this week's Week 11 coverage for the fantastic John J. Parsons, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, and all of us here at both Crack Rackets and the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. Jay, what do we tell our listeners? Hey, great shot. And we will see you all tomorrow night. Thanks, everyone.